Hello everyone and welcome to this session, Leveraging a Global Network of Schools During a Pandemic and Building a Culture of Innovation. Um, a few bits of information about the live sessions if you haven't seen them before. Um, there's a chat panel located on the right hand side of the grid platform. Please feel free to ask us any questions and we'll get back to you. We'll also do this, do our best to pass them along to the speaker. Um, there might be a slight delay in any answers as they are being moderated. Um, if we don't manage to get to them all, don't worry, they're saved in the system and we'll get back to you after the event. Um, so without further ado, we're so pleased to have Dr. Blake Spann, Vice Chancellor for Dwight Schools globally with us today and joining us from the USC, USA. Thank you and over to you, Blake. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, as Sarah said, my name is Blake Spahn and I'm the Vice Chancellor of the Dwight Schools. So essentially, I oversee all of our global campuses. And I thought today what I'd do is start by giving you a little background on Dwight, followed by a description of how our global network has handled the COVID crisis and some of the key learnings that we took away from it. Uh, finally, I'll end with where I think education is going and some of the innovations that we're focusing on. So first, let me uh, play a little video for you, which will give you a sense of Dwight. Dwight is a family school. The vision that my grandfather had 80 years ago was that each and every graduate, you could drop that graduate anywhere in the world and he or she would not only survive, but he or she would thrive. Having different campuses all over the world really allows our students to truly live in the future. You have Dwight Shanghai, Shibao Dwight, Dwight Seoul, Dwight Dubai, Dwight London, Dwight New York, and Dwight Online, which is Dwight Global, we all practice our mission and follow the mission of igniting the spark of genius in each and every student. A Dwight IB student is someone who really thinks outside the box, but they're also a student that really cares. These students actually are interested in the world and how they can help. It could be that they're in a grade four classroom talking about different political systems and Skyping with their peers in grade 10 in Shanghai. It could be grade two having pen pals with their grade two peers in Dubai. We're going to try and give a student every opportunity to live the global vision. We're always thinking about the future. We're thinking 10, 20, 30 years ahead. The International Baccalaureate Curriculum, the IB, is an integral part. The wonderful thing is when you graduate from a Dwight school, every university, they know the Dwight name and they know that it stands for quality. You can attend a Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, Yale. You can attend an Oxford, a Cambridge. You can attend the top art school. You can attend the top film school. A Dwight education puts you in a wonderful position to choose your future. We're all preparing for the best journey that that child can have. When everybody is on the same page and working together to do that, whether they're in China, Dubai, London, Seoul or New York, we know that we are putting children in the best place to succeed. 150 years of experience in education has allowed Dwight to really cement its philosophy of igniting the spark of genius in every child, in personalized learning, in creating a community that is truly a family, and to instilling global vision in each and every one of our students. And that has really allowed Dwight to be in a great position to innovate and to succeed 
for the next 150 years. So that should just give you a little bit of a sense uh, of our schools, of Dwight. Um, you know, the, the important things to really know kind of per the video is, is the school began in 1872. One of the unique aspects is that it's been run by my family for the last 80 years. Uh, Deanne Drew, who you saw in the video, uh, is actually the head of Dwight, New York, as well as being the chair of the IB Heads Council. So she also sits on the IB governing board. And all of the Dwight schools are international baccalaureate or IB schools. And all of our schools rest on three pillars. Uh, personalized learning is our first pillar. Community, which we really think of as a large family. Uh, being a family run school, uh, we teach all of our uh, faculty to think of each and every student as a member of their own family. And then our third pillar, which is global vision. Our mission is really dedicated to igniting that spark of genius in each and every child. And my strong belief, it is all about the execution of whatever your mission might be. And at Dwight, every single student, parent, faculty member, they know the mission. They know about igniting that spark of genius, and it really drives every single thing we do as an educational institution. Uh, the video talked a little bit about our different campuses um, in Shanghai, Seoul, London, Dubai, New York, uh, and then our online school, uh, Dwight Global. Now, when it comes to navigating the challenges uh, in COVID, all of you are aware and, and realize what a difficult time it is and that leadership in a time of emergency is, is different. And number one, health and safety must always be first and foremost in all of our minds. So at Dwight, we hired more nurses, more support staff. We revamped the airflow in all of our buildings. We put air purifiers in every single room, bathroom, offices, classrooms, on and on. No teaching and learning can occur unless everyone is safe. That's obvious. Uh, it, but it has been and it really is still critical to prioritize learning and socio-emotional needs. As learning in a pandemic, it, it's just not the same. We as educators must personalize everything we're doing. Because each child, when you talk to these kids, each child is affected differently by the pandemic. And during the last year, I would say it has been critical to have constant and transparent communication with all stakeholders. You've got to be very clear about the actions you're taking. Never, ever assume that others are aware. Uh, you've got to really know your team. And that means understanding their strengths as well as their blind spots. For example, we created a head of COVID response position. We put someone that was incredibly diligent and extremely organized in that post, even though they didn't have any nursing background or any really uh, specific background for that position, but the organizational uh, capabilities were what's key. And that person has done a phenomenal, phenomenal job uh, in that position. We had a number of faculty members that were just incredibly nervous, um, you know, as COVID was starting. They were nervous about coming back, being in a windowless office, even though it was explained that the airflow in those offices were excellent and it was very safe. So to ease their fears, we had the entire senior leadership team, myself included, give up their offices and move into those windowless offices. And I, I, I strongly believe you can never ask anyone to do something that you yourself are not willing to do. Now, there has to be a constant assessment of the changing circumstances. Uh, in New York, we had conflicting guidance from the WHO, the CDC, and our own Department of Education. Now, we had to follow 
certain guidelines of the Department of Education, but it was very, very confusing. And we were on the phone with that department every single day. And what we had to realize was that yesterday could be completely, totally different than today. And that today, whatever the rules might be, could be completely different than tomorrow. And that type of uncertainty, it's just not easy to live with. But we as leaders must be decisive and we have to act as the worst thing in these types of crises is indecision. All of us need to plan. We have to create a plan. We've got to execute that plan. We then have to measure the results from that plan. And then we have to make corrections to that plan. So now I'll just go through uh, some updates of each of our locations and, and really how we responded uh, and the benefits of, of having a network. Uh, this is just a photo of some of our Dwight Global uh, online children. And Dwight Global Online started about uh, seven years ago. Um, we've got students from all over the world, six continents, um, and operations there, what's interesting, continued without interruption because all of our operations are in the cloud. So it was the one school that was really unaffected, not that the children or the families were not affected by COVID, but the school's operations were unaffected. Uh, a little background on the school, 40% of our students are involved in pre-professional pursuits. So either uh, athletics, some kind of sports, uh, dancing, ballet, acting, uh, something that's really pre-professional and they continue to succeed both inside and outside of the classroom. Now during COVID, um, probably as people would expect, a number of people were looking at fully online options because they were moving, trying to get away from the pandemic. So our enrollment in the fall of this year actually increased by three and a quarter times in the fall of 2020. And, and families were really looking for that dedicated online option. And the one thing about Dwight Global is we have really tried to mimic an on the ground school as much as possible. So your experiences in Dwight Global should be very similar to any of our on the ground schools. Um, you know, we are looking forward to in, in as next year normalizes, having our online kids come back for more in-person experiences. Uh, normally the kids are in uh, three times a year to one of our bricks and mortar campuses, um, usually for orientation at the beginning. And then normally for uh, science labs, they'll come in and do those in person. Uh, and hopefully that'll come back. They normally join a number of our inter-school trips. Uh, of course, all of those were put on hold this year. Um, you know, the one thing that's interesting is there is a lot of negative press that has come out, particularly in the States, about online learning and kids falling behind. But what we found is there's a number of families and children that actually prefer online learning. So near and dear to my own heart, my son, uh, who is in seventh grade uh, at Dwight, well, he was, uh, he was at Dwight, New York since he was two years old. And he actually, in last spring, when everybody went online due to the pandemic, he loved learning online. And he is also a passionate and competitive tennis player. So he wanted to pursue his passion for tennis, but also get a great education. And he actually transferred from Dwight, New York uh, this fall into Dwight Global. So he is a full-time uh, Dwight Global online student. Uh, just a little background, there's 24 countries uh, represented by Dwight Global, 208 full-time students, another 62 students that are taking a few courses but are not full-time. And just another interesting fact is 14% of the students uh, are documented with learning differences and uh, we're able to you know, help those those kids be mainstreamed and they're doing uh, excellent at, at school. This is just uh, 
some photos of some of the activities that they do here. They, they've done a number of great um, cooking classes, uh, virtual labs this year. They did an escape the room virtually. So they, they do a number of great activities with the kids. Again, um, sadly that everybody can't be in person at all for any of these. Uh, our next school to talk about is Shanghai, Shanghai Shibao Dwight, which is uh, our high school in Shanghai. It was actually the first school in our network uh, to shut down. So they shut for the Chinese New Year and then did not reopen. So some of the teachers and kids were, were all over. Uh, they had an immediate transition to virtual learning in February of 2020. Uh, and then they came back in April of 2020 with all of the protocols you'd expect, testing, masks, social distancing. And they faced unique challenges because it's the only boarding school in our network, but have really done a great job and things have ended up running very smoothly. Um, what's interesting is that the school is basically back to functioning at pre-pandemic conditions. So this gives hope to all of us. Uh, masks and social distancing are no longer required on campus except in large gatherings. So that's something, again, that has been great to see. And you know, being that they went out first, they were a huge help. They went out and they were back in session before most of our other schools actually uh, went out in March. So they were back in session in February. They were able to really help all of our schools understand uh, what it took to come back in, in a safe manner. That, that was critical, whether it's the masks, the dividers, the social distancing, the air purifiers, uh, et cetera. Um, right now in Shanghai, 56% uh, of our faculty has actually been, been vaccinated. Now, travel is really on an as-needed basis in Shanghai uh, and only allowed to low-risk areas. So leisure travel is discouraged. So the problem it, it gives us is that international faculty, it's very hard for them to leave China and it's not easy to return. Uh, there's daily temperature and location check-ins that are submitted through, the, through to the government and that goes through the municipal education monitoring system. There's also this Monday morning reporting uh, of each individual's health codes and there's also a 14-day location tracking summary. So all students and all faculty have to uh, enter that uh, every morning, uh, sorry, every Monday when they enter campus. So some of the challenges we face in Shanghai, uh, admissions, incoming admissions this year, it's not been easy because um, our school in Shanghai is mainly made up of local Chinese nationals. And it is all about them getting into the best universities abroad but now there's a lot of fear in traveling abroad. Uh, also with international faculty hiring, uh, that is not easy because they have to go through all of this paperwork and, and constantly changing border rules in China. So that's another thing that, that we're very concerned about. What we are looking forward to though, is renewed face-to-face -face collaboration between our campuses. That's something that uh, all of our students really look forward to. Uh, our next school is Dwight School Seoul. Now they were the second school in our network to shut down. Um, when they returned in May of 2020, they came back at two thirds capacity, testing mask, all of the health protocols. One interesting thing is they actually created dividers for the entire school. Um, they actually sent a number of them to Dwight New York as well. Uh, in their maker space. Uh, no parents have been permitted on campus. I think that's the same for, for almost all of our schools. Uh, they've still done a great job. They're about to lead. Normally all of our schools get together to perform on stage at, at Carnegie Hall. Um, instead, of course, that's gonna be a virtual event this year and uh, Dwight Soul is gonna be leading that virtual uh, music event. 
Uh, and then they've been back uh, to full in-person learning um, for the 2021 school year for, for all grades. Just some photos from Dwight Soul, just to get a little sense of, of the school. And then we've got Dwight London. Um, they had an immediate transition to virtual learning um, in March 2020. Now, a couple things that are very interesting to note about London that were, was different from our other campuses. One is that they had a staggered return. Uh, some of the grades came back before others. And then their elementary school, which was the only school in our network to do this, they had no masks. Uh, in their primary school. And then September this year, a full return for all students. Another unique aspect is that London was in another three month lockdown from December 2020 to February of 2021. Uh, they set up uh, testing sites uh, at school and they offered this three different times uh, for faculty and students. And then now, as all the students are back, there's twice weekly at-home COVID testing for both faculty, staff, uh, and students. They've resumed their usual service, cafe service is back, face-to-face -face music lessons are back. Um, they still have a number of lockdowns in place until everybody uh, is, is vaccinated though. Again, just some photos to get a little bit of color for Dwight London. Uh, and our next school is Dwight Dubai. Now Dwight Dubai also had an immediate transition to virtual learning in March. They returned in September, all of the usual health protocols. Um, again, uh, we were all able to come together to really understand best practices. Um, there's been a major vaccination drive, a low number of cases, uh, currently, all of the pandemic protocols remain in place. Uh, Dwight Dubai was commended by the local education and health authority uh, for both vigilance and safety. Now they've shifted, as all of our schools, many of their events online, uh, of course, while these large events are not possible. Dwight Dubai is very hopeful to return to pre-pandemic uh, procedures in the fall, uh, but of course have a plan A and B in case there's another uh, outbreak. And something I think for all of our schools, there's so many events that have been successful and, and more inclusive online that some of these virtual events uh, will actually remain online, even when everybody uh, is back to uh, regular schooling. Again, here are just some photos again um, of some of the students at work at Dwight Dubai. And uh, finally, Dwight, New York. So I am, I'm based uh, in New York. Um, we had a uh, transition to virtual learning in March, uh, back again um, in, in late August to start school. Um, and I'll tell you, hugely, hugely uh, helpful having the network. So first and foremost, Dwight Global, our online school, uh, was a huge help to all of our schools, really um, understanding best practices online. So I think all of you have seen uh, teaching online does not, it's not exactly the same. It's very different from teaching in person. So having a school that's been around for almost seven years be able to educate and professionally develop our teachers to really understand the do's and don'ts online and, and that was something that was a massive help. Having schools like Shanghai, uh, Seoul, and even London that had been out and then come back successfully before New York did was a huge help. And that actually culminated uh, in, we, as a, uh, we gave a, a number of webinars to all of the heads of schools in New York State to help them understand over the summer uh, what are some of the things that our schools internationally had done in order to be able to allow the students and faculty to return safely to school? And again, I think that has really been the value of having a network. And I would just say, if you don't have a network, it is learning from other countries, the pitfalls that they went through, 
um, and the things that they did very well. So for us, um, we were back in person for our two-year-olds to grade seven every day from August of 2020, and then a hybrid structure. My daughter is in the 10th grade at Dwight, New York. And so her schedule is, let's say Monday, she's in person uh, at Dwight, New York. And then Tuesday, uh, she is actually at home learning uh, synchronously online. All of her classes are synchronous online classes, same schedule as if she was at school, Wednesday back at school, Thursday back on synchronous online classes and so on and, and so forth. Uh, we have weekly COVID testing for faculty and staff, bi-weekly for the students. Um, you know, luckily we have not had a full school shutdown required uh, since the start of, of this uh, school year, the 21-22 school year. And very hopeful, students are doing great and very hopeful that we return uh, to full capacity in 2021. That is, of course, if the government regulations allow for that. Uh, again, just some photos um, from Dwight, New York. And I, I think it's just very important when you think about building a culture of innovation. Um, it's times like this in a pandemic that we really have to take advantage of that. And I thought, you know, I would show just another uh, short video which will allow you to get a sense of uh, what we're doing in terms of uh, innovative thinking. And this is particularly uh, in our elementary school. So hopefully you can hear this. When my students come to my class, I say, good morning, designers, because that's who they are. When they come, we're immersing in the design thinking process. So they are designers. Hi, my name is Lisa Wong. I am the Global Spark Program Director, which oversees the PYP program. STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. STEAM education parallels the whole PYP design program. So when a student is learning something in science, they are able to then understand it from an artistic point of view, or from a design point of view, or even from a mathematics point of view. So it really helps the student learn through a global perspective. Design and technology are part of everyday life. It's not just that we are able to make beautiful things, it's we want to teach children to make beautiful things with a purpose, with something that serves people. Design and technology in our PYP program encourages students to think about solving problems that, that can really help people in other parts of the world, not just our own. Using digital fabrication tools, 3D printers and laser cutters and, and CNC milling machines, students can take their ideas and actually turn them into a reality. Things like 3D printers, laser cutters, vinyl cutters, these are just the new tools. These are just new ways to help us to learn. If I want to be an engineer, if I want to be a designer, these are like my new ruler and my new compass. Today's makerspace is like the modern day wood shop. The Spark Lab is a place where students can come and experience robotics, take their code and actually program something. They get to design and actually fabricate their designs. All of these amazing parts of a process that a designer and engineer goes through, we have our students model that process. I always say ideas matter and we want our students to know that what they're thinking, what they're dreaming, what they're inventing, they matter to us and that's what our program hopes to inspire. So I think what's, what's critical is that we always have to find that silver lining in everything that occurs. And, and who would have thought that we'd be able to get entire schools to go online? Who would have thought we'd be able to upskill teachers in such a short period of time to do things like flip their classrooms? We should be emboldened that our institutions can make major changes in short periods of time. And we really need to rejoice at how innovative our teachers are when we watch them adapt and create virtual plays, global music concerts, virtual art shows. You know, we're even able to hold a virtual graduation that the students will always remember. And it's amazing how things like parent-teacher conferences 
can be just as effective online as they are in person. Uh, now, when it comes to where we actually need to go, I feel very strongly that when a teacher teaches something, our students retain a small part of what was taught. When they are given the chance to put what they learned into their own words and explain what they learned to another student, they retain much more. When students apply what they have learned to a project inside or outside of their class, then that knowledge truly becomes their own. We as educators must focus on the application of knowledge more than the simple retention of just facts. And I believe every student must graduate from Dwight with the ability to take an idea and make that idea a reality via the design thinking process. They need to be able to plan. They need to be able to execute that plan, measure that plan, and then make the necessary corrections to that plan. In design thinking, it's five steps. Empathizing, which is really understanding what the problem is. It is then defining that problem. It's then ideating about solutions, possible solutions to the problem. Then it's taking one possible solution and prototyping it. And then it's testing that prototype. We do this through something called Spark Tank. So many of you will have heard of Shark Tank or Dragon's Den. This is very similar. So our students go through the design process and if they get to the final stage and are making their idea into a reality, they actually get funding from the Dwight Foundation. So students have gotten $500 to $15,000 to help fund their projects. And the projects range from you know, kids as young as second grade all the way to seniors. And these kids have created apps for the hearing impaired. They've created low cost prosthetic limbs. They've created their own fashion line. Uh, most recently, we had someone whose spark of genius, their passion was sneakers and their other passion was giving back. So he combined his two passions into something called soul purpose, where he got people to donate uh, worn or gently used sneakers. He would clean them, get a clean all of them, and then give them to the homeless. He was featured on national uh, and local news stations, and it's really developed uh, a following throughout New York City. So those are the kind of things that are occurring uh, through Spark Tank. Now, if you wanna create widespread culture change in a school, you have to make sure your teachers are brought up to speed quickly. And we did this through something called Frontier Teaching where we brought in a group from Stanford to help train all of our teachers in the design thinking process. We felt if we want our students to be able to take an idea and make it a reality, then our, our, all of our teachers needed to be trained that way. Not just the design teachers or the technology teachers, but the foreign language teachers, the history teachers, the English teachers, and really help our kids learn how to apply what they're learning in class really understanding what project-based learning is all about. And again, to do that, we have to invest in our teachers. And this frontier teaching is something we've continued and it really uh, has been one of the best professional development developments we've ever done uh, with our faculty because it's not normal uh, for a teacher to understand uh, minimum viable product, MVP, uh, but to to get them to understand how to test a minimum viable product and then train their students how to do that is incredibly uh, rewarding. In conclusion, I would just urge all of you to really look at the silver linings that the pandemic has, has brought to us. Take this opportunity to push better ways of doing things so as to allow all of your students to really reach uh, their full potential. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Uh, I really appreciate it. I know I see a few questions. Um, I can, you know, quickly answer a couple of these. I know I went a little bit over. Um, you know, one of the questions is, 
does the staff uh, have an opportunity at the Dwight schools to move around? Uh, absolutely. It's one of the things that we really love, which is, you know, there's only so many leadership positions open at one school. So we allow our best people to transfer. We had our associate head of the lower school uh, in New York moved to Dwight London to run the middle and upper school. We knew he's a great administrator. So we helped train him. So he went through professional development under our head of middle and upper school in New York to prepare him for that. He was British, wanted to be closer to his family. Things like this with both teachers who want to spend a few years abroad um, or are looking for more leadership opportunities. Now, we also give students the opportunity to spend a trimester or an entire year abroad at one of our other schools, uh, whether it's you know learning Mandarin and they want to spend time in, in Shanghai um, or just want to experience uh, culture, the culture in, in Dubai. Um, those are the types of things that are, are, are happening. Uh, you know, a, a question is how do you train your staff to manage in unprecedented uh, times? Really, it's some of the things I mentioned. You have to be very transparent with your communication and you have to just be there. And when, you know, when we talk about that family ethos, and again, many mission statements and igniting the spark of genius sound similar, but it is all about how we execute our mission and our pillars. And, you know, we really, our second pillar is community. It's about treating people like family. So it's being there uh, for the staff, really for them personally. And in terms of how to manage, there's the professional development for best practices um, online for online teaching, but there's also constant reminder of what the staff is going through, what your team is going through, as well as the students. So we've really also upped um, a lot of uh, well-being sessions, whether it be yoga, breathing, um, just time to kind of get away from, from the grind that's affecting all of us not only during the class day, but outside of it, sick parents, you know, taking care of people, being cooped up in a room. So again, our counselors have been phenomenal and our administrators have been great in, in really uh, giving the time to, you know, uh, really speak to and help uh, the teachers. Um, you know, question about the, the, the family ethos and the IB uh, curriculum contributing to students' resilience. I, I just think when students know that you support them, that contributes to resilience. If you think about it with regards to family, children can feel if they have unconditional love from their parents. And no matter if they fall or if they stumble, if they're bleeding, they're going to wipe it off and just keep going. And that feeling of, of unconditional support from a parent's love is critical. Now, it might be not totally unconditional with a the school, they've got to do certain things, but the support that they feel from the school, that is what really contributes uh, to resilience. Um, a question, do you feel having Dwight Global as an established online school or Dwight Shanghai, which was affected first, where the lessons learned could be replicated elsewhere was most beneficial for your other campuses when reacting to the change and learning due to COVID? Absolutely. This was critical. So again, you can think about and talk to experts and listen to them, but when you're getting different advice, from the WHO, the CDC, and your own Department of Health, how are you gonna figure out what's the right thing to do? So when we have uh, a school that not only left their campus, but came back with new protocols that worked, that's something that everybody can learn from. And by the way, that are th these are things that we must continue to learn from with the pandemic of what has worked and what hasn't. And we've seen, we need to get kids back into schools. And if there are schools that can't afford air purifiers or to revamp their airflow system, we need to find the money to help schools do that. Because the biggest problem in this pandemic 
are the students that have not had access to laptops and good Wi-Fi that are really falling behind. So we need to get kids back into school uh, as soon as possible. And yes, Dwight Global Online was a massive help to our other campuses, just in terms of uh, best practices of teaching online. I Brilliant. Think that thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was so great. Um, it was so interesting to get such a global viewpoint on running a school network. So thank you so much for getting up so early to be with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, our next panel session will start shortly and is looking at inclusion, which is one of the key topics that emerged globally during the current times. And um, I really hope you enjoy the rest of the event. And, and thank you again. And take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sarah.